Coming up on Tech News Today, Snap's earnings aren't really making investors very happy. Facebook wants you to watch it like a TV. Consumer Reports drops its recommendation of the Microsoft Surface. And how to give your kid an effective tech detox. All that and more coming up next on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1829, recorded Thursday, August 10th, 2017. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Tracker, a coin-sized tracking device that pairs with your smartphone and keeps you from losing your most valued possessions. Visit thetracker.com right now and enter promo code TNT to save 20% off any order. And by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Home plays a big role in your life, and that's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. It lets you apply simply and understand the entire mortgage process fully, so you can be confident that you're getting the right mortgage for you. Get started at rocketmortgage.com slash TNT. And by Eero. Never think about Wi-Fi again with Eero's hyper-fast, super simple Wi-Fi system. And now the second generation Eero is tri-band and twice as fast. For free overnight shipping, visit Eero.com, select overnight shipping at checkout and enter code TNT. Welcome to Tech News Today. This is the show where we tell you what you need to know about technology today. I'm Megan Maroney. I'm Jason Howell. How's it going, Megan Maroney? It's going well. Excellent. Got a couple days off this week. I'm feeling refreshed. refreshed. Yeah. And now it's just right back into the tech grind. And yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Let's how, go. How about we get to the snap? Yes. Ain't no amount of puppy dog face filters that can improve Snap's quarterly earnings released today. The company missed every single one of Wall Street's expectations, delivering less revenue and fewer users than investors had hoped for. The only glimmer of hope was that animated hot dog, which was viewed 1.5 billion times and called the world's first augmented reality superstar what? by Snap <laughs> CEO Evan Spiegel. Spiegel and his co-founder yeah. Bobby Murphy both say they believe in the success of the company and will not sell their shares this year. Uh, Do you not know the hot dog? Uh, no. What? I, you know what I, I did? I missed that. I, I think you were away because oh. I did discuss with Micah Sargent when he came in your place. And there you go. Uh, he is a huge fan of the hot dog. Uh, okay. This is, I had no idea that the dancing hot dog was a celebrity or in fact that it existed at all. But there you go. <laughs> See, this is why Snap is losing. Even their most well-known celebrity well, isn't known by all. It is amazing. I mean, like you can put it on a, um, it's very advanced <laughs> augmented reality. Like you could put it on a shopping cart and spin this it. This is what and, it's come to, huh? Yeah. Animated hot dog. Uh, I guess. I the guess promise of AR. That's what it's come. They lost $443 million. <sighs> that's four times what they lost Oof. last quarter. Uh, expect there it oh, is. I take it back. That's pretty awesome. Is, is that yeah, you right now? You know, is that on your floor? What, what's going on, is that, Brian? Is that your hot dog? Uh, hot Somebody else, hot yeah, dog. Ran, random animated hot mm -hmm. dog. Uh, they had expectations of $186.8 million. Uh, the reality was $182 million, so that's a lot of Snapchat hot dogs, I'd mm -hmm, say. Mm -hmm. uh, they have 173 million daily active users, or DAOs, DAOs as we call it, and yeah. one Yao, one yearly active user, that's you. Um, <laughs> yeah, that sounds about they right. They need a lot more people not like you. Yeah, well, so their <laughs> daily active users up 21% year over year. Average revenue per use grew 109% year over year. So there's some good positive things about, about this, but... Um, I think in general, from from everything that I was reading, advertiser interest is starting to kind of wane a little bit. And it's just really hard to compete with a company like Facebook, especially when Facebook has Instagram, which in many counts compares very you know, pretty closely to a lot of Snapchat's fe features. Advertisers are siding more for Instagram right now, and that's hurting Snap. It is, it is it's shocking to me because I feel like it's uh, every child age 13 to 20 um, spends their it. entire day right. on it. Right, yeah, high engagement. 
among the people who are among the the users that are there. That's another positive. Um, but and and actually, that's a really good demographic too, right? Like the that that core uh, demographic is a very valuable one for advertisers to want to reach. So there's positive going on there, but I think it's just the growth aspect is not nearly as good as it needs to be so soon after the IPO mm -hmm. kind of kind of makes you wonder if you're looking at another Twitter. Yeah, did you guys talk about the Sarah Ha? Do you know what I'm talking about? The new like social media? Probably not. It's like no. Sarah Ha. No. It's some kind of weird new social media site that kids these days are all over. And it's just like anonymous comments. Um, like you would <sighs> put, put like Jason Howell dot Sarah Ha. I wish I knew how to pronounce it. It's a very weird word. I think it's Sarah with a ha at the end. And then like- All one word? Anybody could, yeah, anybody could like make comments like, you know, I could write on there like, um, you're my best friend or, do you have, do you have one? No. The Brian? Honesty First Secret Messaging App. Oh, another secret messaging app, great. Yeah. So it's like, really, do we have more room for this? Um, I'm not sure that we do, but you can't slow down progress. <laughs> <laughs> it's all, it's also been amusing to me seeing all of like the tech journalists, like Mike Isaac yeah. from the New York Times. Yeah, okay, like, now that you it. mention it, I saw his timeline last night. I was thoroughly confused. Yeah. I was like, what am I even looking at yeah. right now? So I'm happy you brought this right. up. Right, okay, yeah, it's just like people sense. making comments. And uh, Micah Sargent, who I talked about, who loves the hot dog, like I went, I won on his and I just left a comment like that he needs to show more pictures of his chihuahuas. And now it's not anonymous anymore. Mm. But I think- okay. They're not using it right. Like I think no like tech journalist can figure out how a teenager is going to use an app like that. Yeah, that ship has sailed for mm -hmm. them. Yeah, I think you're right. Facebook has a new watch tab for those of you thirsty for another avenue of original video content online. Uh, several dozen new shows are hitting a small group of users in the U.S., at least at first, uh, via the new section with original content, including a number of reality shows, sports coverage, mini documentaries. Uh, Facebook has had an increased focus on video within the network, uh, placed much importance on video in the network, and this will offer more opportunities for the company to keep users tuned into that very lucrative uh, content stream. Uh, so partners are going to earn 55% of the ad, ad revenue. Facebook keeps 45% of that. And yeah, lots of new shows. They say they're going to be bringing, uh, what did they say? Up to th <laughs> They hope to scale to thousands of shows. Do you think people are going to think of Facebook when they think of, I want passive viewing, I'm going to go to Facebook and tune in? Uh, I don't know. I mean, who knows? We uh, Things change so quickly. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, if they do it right, sure. And they're talking about shows like Facebook style shows, or could it be like Game of Thrones? No, nothing like that. In fact, it seems like it's very light on sc actual scripted mm -hmm. stuff. You know, like a lot of documentary style stuff, a lot of reality stuff. Um, I don't know if I necessarily saw content there that's like, this is a TV show that you can get on TV, but you're getting it through Facebook now. It's all like original programming. Um, I don't know if the programming was necessarily created specifically for Facebook's network. Facebook has funded some of the shows, but really it wants to offer publishers the platform so that they can offer content to to it. So I don't know how original this content is when they say original. Yeah, I know, and it's supposed to customize to your interests over time like right. Facebook does. So, I mean, better because it hasn't launched yet, but I did, I didn't even realize there was a video tab on my Facebook app and I went to it and it was a bunch of garbage that I didn't mm. want to, you know, it was like, I don't even know. I I, th I tweeted about it. It was something about urine and pools. Like, I, I don't, I'm Fun. not interested in that. Yeah, there it was. That, <laughs> that, that was a video. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, it's Facebook, better get better you, know, <laughs> yeah. you know people so well. Um, so, okay. So also uh, Mark Zuckerberg uh, in his Facebook post about this, he said, we, we believe it's possible to rethink a lot of experiences through the lens of building community, including watching video. Like okay. that was in, like going to a movie theater. Like that was all right. That, you did not invent that Mark Zuckerberg. We were watching videos <laughs> known as films in the theater long before you were born. So is this, so is this Facebook saying we want to be like another YouTube? Like you th you think about video, you come to Facebook and you watch your video here. I mean it's it's not as user generated necessarily. It's more higher, you know, production value and actual publishers putting their content there, but it kind of seems like a, a piece of what they're paying what they're 
putting together here. Yeah, I mean, it kind of kind of seems like they just want people to stick around, and not go anywhere, and right. people are have sharing. more of a reason to leave that right. tab open yeah. and maybe add on another half hour of, of daily usage. Yeah, people are sharing less. Yeah, um, they're you know they're That's doing all point. kinds of things. Like there's a, some there's some quirk with the algorithm now that like my groups show up first. So like I'm constantly getting reminders of like weird groups that I joined that I didn't even realize <laughs> that I joined. I mean, I'm sure I did at some time point, but there's something happened with the algorithm that now those notifications come first before anything else. And I think that's another way that they're trying to say like, oh, you know, you, all the, someone posted in your group of, you know, I love Petaluma or whatever random group. Are that's, you in that group? Uh, oh, you're, not, you're not on Facebook anymore. I haven't been on Facebook since December. Um, God, it's crazy. The time flies. Uh, and in some ways it totally doesn't either. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe pushing the groups aspect is part of what Mark Zuckerberg has been saying. They're pushing more closely towards, which is kind of fusing the, your real world life and Facebook and, and kind of making them meet a little bit more so that the stuff that you do on Facebook surfaces in your real world a little bit more. Maybe that group happens to meet every Tuesday at a coffee shop. And so now you know, now you're, now you're more likely to know because they're letting you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, according to a consumer report survey of 90,000 tablet and laptop owners, the Microsoft Surface has the worst failure rate in the industry. Mm. As a result, the magazine is pulling its recommended designation for all Surface products. Sick burn, consumer reports. 25% of Surface owners say they've had problems within two years of buying one. A breakage record that is much higher than most other brands. Now CNET, which is a direct competitor of consumer reports, still gives Surface products high ratings. And so Paul, Paul Therott's article on this is interesting. He says that the Surface products really benefited from the positive editorial reviews. So there are a lot of people that, you know, get these products advance, uh, in advance and, and they're frustrated. They're probably a lot of PowerBook users, Mac PowerBook users, and they were frustrated with the lack of innovation and they thought, oh, okay, well, this is great. Um, so, so it's interesting because it's a little back and forth. I mean, these are the consumer reports that's based on people who have used this, these products and they don't like them so much. It includes the Surface Laptop and the Surface Book. So basically what, what Paul Therod is saying here is that Surface has a really good first impression, <laughs> right? For, like, for people, for writers, you know, like maybe for writers who got this laptop before anyone else and had to write a review about it. <laughs> right, right. But I mean, you know, that's based off of their experience with it, which it sounds like. And, and I would agree, like a lot of people who actually get their hands on a Surface um, would say that the experience, the the hardware and everything is pretty impressive. It's a, it's a nice piece of, of, uh, of technology to get your hands on. It seems like what Consumer Reports is saying, like, yeah, that may be the case, but the failure rate over time is so high that we actually have to peel it back. And like, I'm, I'm so used to kind of being exposed to that in the Android world where reviews of phones are so great when they come out, but then all you have to really do is check in on them about a year later. And that's when you really see how good that phone is. It, you know, if everyone's complaining about this and that and the other thing, then, you know, it's too bad you didn't know that in the beginning, but it's really hard to know that in the beginning. If Microsoft's track record in this case is such that they're starting to realize that that failure rate is really high, then I think that's a pretty important thing to call out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's the hinge. They said the the Surface that has the detachable keyboard is mo more likely to fail. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, yeah, they 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 pointed out problems in this case. At least some of them freezing up, unexpected shutdowns, touch screen issues. So it's kind of a a grab bag of issues. <laughs> After the break, Uber tries to get less creepy, Ikea wants to climb on your roof, and Disney gets sued. But first, let's take a minute to thank Tracker, the sponsor of this episode. There's a ritual for looking for your lost keys. First, you check all the obvious places, the couch, your pockets, then the weird places, the bathroom, the fridge, the hamper, then you start getting creative. I don't know if you've ever lost your keys in the peanut butter jar. Someone probably has. Eight years ago, Tracker changed everything when they released their first tracking device. And now they've done it again with the all new Tracker Pixel. With Tracker Pixel, you'll never worry about losing your things again. Tracker Pixel is the lightest Bluetooth tracking device on the market. Place Tracker Pixel on whatever you tend to lose, your keys, your wallet, even your dog or your cat. It's small enough to fit on your smallest items. When you misplace an item that has a tracker pixel attached, use your smartphone and a 90 decibel alert will help you find it in seconds. 
I have a tracker on my keys. It is super useful. It even has a powerful LED light that you can find items in the dark. So if they're under the couch, you can see them. Lose your phone, just press the button on your tracker pixel and your phone rings, even if it's on silent. You can even locate your items if it's miles away because every tracker user is part of the largest crowd locate network in the world. I lost my keys the other day and I got a little alert on my phone that I had found someone else's keys in the same day. It's very helpful. It feels good to help other people. Tracker's 30 day money back guarantee means you truly have nothing to lose. Go to thetracker.com and enter promo code TNT to save 20% off any order, that's T-H-E-T-R-A-C-K-R.com, promo code TNT for 20% off. All right, more news. If you've ever thought it was kind of strange to get a text message from that random Uber driver on your phone, uh, you might like this one. It's kind of strange to think that Uber hasn't had in-app messaging until now, but better late than never, the new in-app feature allows riders to connect with the driver in chat. Those messages are then read aloud to the Uber driver so they can keep their eyes on the road and not be distracted by typing or anything like that. However, there is a simple kind of thumbs up button that will surface. It'll appear for them so that they can tap once while they're driving, telling the rider that they heard their message loud and clear and giving them the thumbs up uh, that it's received. If I still used Uber, uh, this would make me feel a lot safer. Um, it's, you know, it was always creepy. I never knew, I never knew that they didn't have our phone number yeah. until we said that, I said that on one of our shows. I said, you know, it's totally creepy that, that an Uber driver has my phone number. And then we got tons of emails from Uber drivers and other people saying they don't really have your phone number. It's, you know, they, they don't ever see that. So it's, but it was just the idea of it was creepy. Yeah. And getting it out of nowhere and, you know, it's like unknown Unknown number. I've gotten so used to ignoring anything that doesn't have a name and for my contact book associated with it. So I guess if you use Uber a lot prior to this, you'd be used to the fact that that would be the way, and and you would you know pay attention to it. But it was just a little strange to be communicating with someone and not have a name necessarily associated to it. Um, and I guess. So they were anonymizing it prior. That's what was happening. They were masking the identities. Um, but the masking that they were doing wasn't available in all markets. So here in the U.S. it was. Different markets didn't have the ability to do that. And hence the chat system uh, is introduced. And now they're going to opt for that. It's going to preclude the need to share those phone numbers going forward. Well, it's one of those little things that you don't think about. But like when they were showing, when we're, they were deciding, oh, yeah, let's just do it in in uh, in their in your chat program, I mean, in your email pro, I mean, in your messaging program, uh, because obviously no one in that room thought it was weird that like you would get a text message from an unknown number and it would say, "Where are you?" Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> and then exactly. you would just have no problem saying, "Here's my location, unknown number." <laughs> Whoever you happen to be, maybe yeah. someone just that just got really lucky asking you that question at the right time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But. So this is the 180 days of change. This is part of oh, the this is part of that. Mm -hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. we've been celebrating this for a while yeah. now mm -hmm. with parties and talking about it occasionally. Although we haven't really been talking about Uber a whole lot on the show lately. No, thank goodness. That's all right. Watch out, Tesla. Ikea is getting into the home battery and solar panels market. And don't you worry. You don't have to put them together and attach them to your roof yourself. Experts will mm -hmm. assemble the panels for you, unlike uh, that Billy bookcase you had to assemble yourself. The batteries and solar panels are only available in the UK for now. If you're interested, you can get a free quote at their website. IKEA itself claims the company will be solar neutral by 2020. They've installed over 700,000 solar panels on their buildings across the globe. So once they, if they get into the market outside of the UK, I feel like IKEA is a trusted name. They would be the most trusted common name in solar panels at this point. Because I mean, Tesla doesn't have like a proven product. They haven't been around as long as Ikea. They're not in everybody's home like Ikea products are. So I think that they would be a threat if they got past. The yeah, UK. I see what you mean as far as kind of like a widely known uh, brand associated. I feel like here in the States, Solar City is pretty well known as far as that's concerned. But are, yeah, how does that stack up to a brand name like Ikea? Ikea is not doing the solar panels themselves. It's a partnership with a company called Solar Century, which is actually the largest solar company in the UK. A um, little disappointed they don't have solar tiles yet, but we'll go ahead and give them some time because even Tesla is only just rolling those out uh, through Solar City. Uh, but they are called Sostral, 
I don't soul straw is you know with a little circle over the A as uh, the IKEA names for their products often has. So um, yeah, it's it's an interesting product to have through them, and they actually have a really good kind of warranty as well. They're doing twenty five year guarantee on the panels, ten years guarantee on the inverter, and then six year warranty on the install and performance. They said it starts at four thousand dollars, which is pretty cheap. Mm -hmm. I mean, compared to what we just paid for our solar. And P I get emails all the time because on a show a couple months ago, I said uh, that we didn't use SolarCity. And if you wanted to know why, you could email me. And many people emailed me. Uh -huh. uh, we use a local company called Silver Solar, and we've been very happy so far with them. Yeah. So I wonder if, if IKEA does bring this outside of the UK market. Um, I mean, they would have to do some sort of a partnership there too. And I wonder who that partner would be. If, they, if in the UK, they're partnering up with the largest solar provider there. Like, would that be a company like Solar City if they came to the U.S.? I guess they'd have to reach that agreement in order to make that happen. Yeah, and the other thing they're talking about is the batteries that let you right. store your own solar power, which you can't, I mean, I don't know if they, that exists in the U.S. now, if you can do that. I know you can't do it in California, I don't think. The the Tesla solar batteries? The solar batteries. batteries. Like, I haven't the home heard batteries? of anyone Yeah, I don't, I don't know if those are actually hitting homes yet, yeah. yet or not. I, I thought that they were, but... Yeah, I haven't really heard much about that since, but. Yeah, I would love to be able to store my own solar power and use it. Um, I mean, it's so complicated. PG&E makes it so complicated. When we first, our first bill came out, they, they sent me this PDF that was like 45 pages long of like well, how to understand your solar bill. They want you to regret ever getting solar they and do. not relying on them 100%. Uh, Berkshat is, is in effect right now. Although that doesn't look like Burke's hands, but that's okay. <laughs> Burke, Burke says, but Ikea has brick and mortar. There Burke chat's getting in more and more interesting as the days progress. Uh, has brick and mortar. And that, that could be a big deal too, right? Like you're, yeah. you're walking through your Ikea and you're like, well, for $5,000, I can get solar, solar on my roof. Uh, they have three different types, by the way. They have uh, rooftop, which is like the traditional solar paneling. Uh, rooftop plus, which are black panels, so better energy uh, electricity generation, and then roof integrated, which is actually embedded into the roof itself. So if you wanted to go for the most elegant solution, it would be that. And I think it's like another grand or something mm -hmm. on top of it. And I don't know if this happens in all Home Depots, but um, I that's how I got started in this process because I was go I was in a Home Depot and the Solar City, the nice Solar City lady came up to me and said, "Are you interested in solar?" And so and you didn't just walk as fast as you could away because no, that's usually no, what I, I do in I those situations. Her, I gave her my phone number and they never, they still haven't stopped calling. <laughs> oh, good, good to know. Good to know. <laughs> Disney is coming under fire with a class action lawsuit that says the company is collecting and sharing information about the children using 42 of its apps with advertisers. The lawsuit says that Disney did not appropriately gain parental consent before collecting and selling that data for ad targeting purposes, something that the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, or COPPA, uh, was created to ensure. Disney, on its part, claims the lawsuit is a misunderstanding of basic COPPA principles, and they say they look forward to their day in court. And I have a feeling they have the money to back up that statement. <laughs> yeah, and so the, yeah, we'll the money, the lawyers. And <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it would be hard for me to believe that they didn't like yeah. follow the letter of the law. They probably haven't followed the spirit of the law. Uh, I, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me at all if these apps were tracking kids in a way that COPA says that you're not supposed to. I mean, you have to have consent before collecting IP addresses mm -hmm. and location information. Uh, and then this class action lawsuit says that they're tracking them through advertising software development kits or SDKs. So, yeah, I mean, I hate the idea that our kids are being tracked and that they're, uh, they already have user behavioral profiles. Mm -hmm. And that's what COPA, it was there to prevent. Um, but, uh, I mean, I, I think it's, it's sort of par for the course at this point. I mean, I, what I would bet is that it's somewhere along the way, like a kid has to like click something that says like I am over 13 or you have, you know, they've done something. The parent has to agree to it. So yeah, I'm not a fan of class action lawsuits, but I would uh, like there to be more laws surrounding tracking our kids. in this Or way. more clarity around this. Like maybe Disney is in, in, you know, intruding on the rules around COPA and in, in which case, Okay, if a cl class action lawsuit is what's required to get them to change it. I mean, this is, what is it, 40 some odd, 42 apps 
uh, I mean, the, basically all the Disney apps you've heard of, Frozen Freefall, Temple Run Oz, Where's My Water, Story Theater, Palace Pets, like all of their their main apps fall into this category. It would be really surprising to me that a company like Disney that built its brand for for decades, for so long around kids, wouldn't have paid attention to these things when building out its app portfolio. But I mean, maybe it did. You know, uh, back in 2013, uh, Playdom, which is a, a Disney-owned developer, actually received a $3 million civil penalty from the FTC for COPA violations then, too. So it's not like it doesn't happen. It's mm -hmm. not like it couldn't happen. Yeah, I mean, maybe they've looked at it and said, you know, well, if we get the fine, then so be it. We're Disney. We can make that up. <laughs> Just think of all that we've gained for however many years collecting that data and selling it. Right. That just sounds so bad. Maybe that's why they're starting the streaming service in order to recoup the cost of the fines for... Many, yes. kids. Man, we really put two and two together on this <laughs> yeah. one. Uh, up next, we talked to Dr. Michael Bishop about the unique pull of screens and internet addiction in today's teens. But first, let's take a minute to thank Rocket Mortgage, the sponsor of this episode. The mortgage experience, if you've ever gone through it, you know it isn't really keeping up with the times very well. It hasn't anyways. It was dated. It needed a client-focused technological revolution. And that is why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. Rocket Mortgage gives you the confidence that you need when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. It's very simple. It allows you to fully understand all the details and also be confident that you're getting the right mortgage for you. It's convenient. Their trusted partners allow you to share your financial information with Rocket Mortgage at the touch of a button. They've made it super simple for that. It's powerful whether you're looking to buy your first home or or even your 10th Rocket Mortgage is able to perform thousands of calculations in seconds. It does all the heavy lifting for you. It's based on your income, assets, and credit. Rocket Mortgage takes all of that, analyzes all the home loan options for which you qualify, and then finds the one that's just right for you and your situation. Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Apply simply, understand fully, mortgage confidently. To get started, just go to rocketmortgage.com slash TNT. That's rocketmortgage.com slash TNT. Equal housing lender licensed in all 50 states. NMLS, consumeraccess.org, number 3030. And we thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support iPhones have ruined a generation, so say the headlines. Kids are having less sex, but they're in danger of serious mental health issues because of how much time they spend on social media and gaming. What is a parent or a person struggling with their own tech addiction to do? Rather than sit and stew about it, we invited Dr. Michael Bishop, founder of Summerlane Camps, to talk with us. Dr. Mike is a father and the founder of Summerlane Camps, the first adventure-based camp focused on screen time, overuse issues, in the U.S. Welcome to the show, Mike. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Well, tell us a little bit about uh, the mission of Summerlane Camps. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, really unique organization. Uh, what we're focused on is helping young people learn how to live with technology. So we don't see technology as a bad thing. We see it as a integral part of life. Uh, you know, my wife is a second grade teacher there. <laughs> we just started school back up today and, uh, you know, the issuing iPads to new students, my, my, uh, kids, uh, are in middle school as well. And, you know, they're required to bring cell phones for, uh, looking things up in class. So, you know, we, we don't see technology and, uh, you know, use of, uh, 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 smartphones and devices in school is necessarily a bad thing, but we do think that there is an issue with uh, the overuse of technology. And I'm sure that most parents out there watching this would agree that it's just, you know, it's a different world today. We are literally the first generation of parents learning how to raise children with all these digital distractions. And so what we've created Summerlin Camps for is a tool for parents to uh, send their kids to the camp so that uh, their kids can learn how to live life in balance with video games, smartphones, the internet, so on and so forth. So, so my three kids went away to camp this uh, this summer. The two 12-year-olds went backpacking for a week, no technology. Yeah. Uh, my daughter went to a camp for a week where she had no technology. They came back, mm. changed, but then immediately yeah. after that, uh, it was back to Snapchat and Instagram. <laughs> yeah. You got to keep up those streaks, you know? <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> and that's what I would have expected. You know, I mean, how realistic is it for us as parents to expect change? You know, if we don't do a little handholding here and set some boundaries and not only change, you know, our expectations for our kids, but change ourselves and change our family culture. And that's what we do at Summerlin Camps. We're not just addressing uh, with the kids, uh, you know, helping them uh, set some goals, uh, you know, uh, l learn about, uh, you know, keeping a journal, uh, you know, uh, 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 breaking down what they're going to do in, in, in a day uh, to fit within their, their long-term goals, you know, including how much time they spend online, but also changing the family system. Uh, so what that means, so w one of the things we do at Summerlin Camps is we uh, have a family workshop. And at the family workshop, we talk to parents about, okay, uh, you know, so what boundaries should we put up? Uh, you know, possibly no smartphones at dinner. Uh, another thing we do is we implement uses of behavioral tracking devices like pedometers. Uh, you know, a fun activity that we suggest for parents is uh, instead of just putting a pedometer on your one child that might have you know, a problem with technology addiction or not getting enough exercise, put a pedometer on every member of the family. And then make it a family tradition that after dinner, okay, everybody check their pedometer. Whoever has the least amount of steps, that person does the dishes. And so that could be the child that's playing too much video games. It could even be the dad, you know, who's spending too much time on his computer laptop at work or, or even the mom, you know, or, or any other child. So, uh, you know, we, just sending your child to a camp and not having a plan uh, to put in place when you go back home it's really not realistic to expect changes uh, in technology use to uh, to stick. You know, you, 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 you've really got to supply not only the child, but the whole family with the tools to be successful. Yeah, I feel like what you say about um, setting an example is a really important component of that. I know with yeah. us, we have a seven and four year old and. You know, there was there was a time some there was a point sometime last year where I just where I suddenly made the re the realization how many of our blank moments, the random moments throughout the home, were one of us standing there, you know, staring at our phone like swiping through, doing totally non essential things, but setting a certain example of that this is kind of normal and hey, you know, why don't we instead put our phone on top of the refrigerator when we're home and as long as they are awake. Like our time yeah. is focused on the family and set that example. Same with driving, right? Like it's yeah. so easy to, when you're driving, reach for the phone and do the thing, but they're watching and that's an example that you're setting. Yeah, that, that's a great point. And I have to remind myself of that uh, too. You know, I, I gotten in a habit of just putting my smartphone in my glove compartment now when I get in, in the car, because I realize that, you know, I'm, I'm role modeling for my kids and they're going to be driving soon. Yeah. So, you know, most families, uh, what we find, they just haven't done that hard work of sitting down and doing the math and counting the costs of, uh, you know, unlimited gameplay. And again, we, we don't have anything uh, necessarily against video games. We think that, you know, you, you know, our participants can still enjoy playing video games and uh, you know, using all the benefits of technology. Uh, but we've got to set some limits and we've got to figure out, okay, if, you know, let's say, uh, you go to camp and you have a great time and you, all our, all our camps are at, uh, university campuses. And let's say you've, you know, you, you've liked the, you know, seeing the, uh, the science exhibits in the science building, you decide, okay, I want to become a scientist. Okay. Well then let's break that down. What do you have to do to achieve that goal? And how does game playing fit into this? And, can you, you know, go to college, get a master's, a doctorate in biology, for example, and play unlimited video games? And generally the answer is no. So we've got to figure out how to set some boundaries here. And the unfortunate thing is most parents haven't done that work. And so what happens is kids go to college and we're seeing uh, uh, freshmen fail out at the rate of about 50 to 60%. Now, I don't know if you if you know that statistic, but, you know, uh, about half to a little bit more than half of uh, incoming freshmen do not complete college. And I, I think with this generation coming up, we're going to see that get worse and worse. What about the problem with empathy? I mean, that's what uh, I haven't seen any actual I mean, I've seen a studies where kids will go away for camp for eight days and they'll do empathy studies before. And when they come home and there's really a difference. But I mean, mm -hmm. is that something that you are able to work on at the camp? Uh, empathy as far as the 
the parents. Well, no, um, empathy meaning like that. That's what I worry about. Um, the the fact that we're like this so often and communicate. All of our communication is mediated through a right. screen um, with kids that haven't developed their brains. Like, is that is that something that you're seeing? Um, is there like do you work on more interaction in real life? Oh yeah, absolutely. And so uh, w what we're seeing more and more of is that kids are missing out on social practice that that previous generations got uh it, it's a different kind of socialization uh that that occurs now and so what happens is kids get kind of caught in this uh self-perpetuating cycle where you know they're uh maybe they had a bad interaction so they go online they start interacting through games or social media uh, they're isolating more now they're falling out of social practice more they're they're becoming more socially awkward so they go online more and it just becomes this self-perpetuating loop. So what, <laughs> what the, the main thing we do at this camp is we do a technology detox and get them socializing with others. And uh, of course, you know, the kids that come to the camp are essentially all on about the same uh, social level. Interesting. So one one thing that uh, we talk about on the show pretty regularly because we talk about a lot of social social networks and you see mm -hmm. this in gaming, mobile games a lot of times have this built into it is this idea that the people that are working there are specifically developing these services and these games with very addictive qualities built into them. It's kind of like a feature. Oh. It's how they get people to come back yeah. time and time again. And meanwhile, you've got kids who are exposed to these things. Their brains are developing mm -hmm. around right. these highly addictive tools. Uh, how much of a responsibility do you think falls on the side of the people creating those tools and those games? Well, th that's a great question. And I mean, ultimately, uh, you know, if a company is for profit, their duty is to their shareholders yeah. and they're going to do what it takes to to boost that that that, you know, shareholder value. So, uh, you know, as, as that's created additional burden on us as parents, especially this, you know, uh, you know, people my age, you know, parents that are raising this first generation dealing with all the distra digital distractions out there. Uh, that, that's why programs like Summerlin Camps are so needed uh, today. Right. They're, they're, you know, they're not teaching this stuff in schools. And so, so how much of this is therapy and how much of this is camp? I know you're a retired psychologist. Um, yes, and sir. Uh, this, you, the, the people that uh, work there are, are called coaches, not therapists, but they are actually therapists. That's correct. We do use uh, licensed therapists uh, at the program, but you know we're we're trying not to stigmatize this. Uh, you know, I really believe from my uh, career as a psychologist that uh, change has to bubble up from within. Uh, most behavior change programs for teens out there are really punitive in nature. And we're completely on the other end of the continuum as far as that's concerned. Uh, what, what we believe is that, you know, a person has to want to change uh, for change to be effective. And so, you know, our program is about showing them these incredible opportunities. I, I could just go on and on about the, you know, the rock climbing, rafting, zip lining. We do these treasure hunts where, uh, you know, it, it, you know, without any spoiler alerts, you know, everybody comes home with a, with an artifact and, you know, we, we, we have really great experiences for them. And, uh, uh, you know, we believe that's really integral to the behavior change process. You know, you, you've got to get to a point where you say, okay, yeah, I, I, I want to change my life. Um, so, uh, we see our therapist as more of a, of a coach then, uh, as opposed to a traditional therapist, you know, we're, 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 uh, targeting behaviors. Uh, these kids have gotten into some bad habits. Uh, it is not a, um, you know, uh, we'd rather see it as a habit than pathology. And uh, like any habits, habits can be changed, you know, and, and when you were younger, you probably had a habit of, uh, you know, maybe drinking soda pop or eating candy. And, and as, as you matured, you, you dropped that habit. Now you have new habits. And, and that's the way we see this. So where are the camps located and what are ages, uh, what are the age ranges? Uh, age ranges is uh, 10 through 18. We've got a, a, a beautiful camp in Western North Carolina. 
and we're scouting a West Coast location for summer 2018. Uh, all of Summerlin camps are going to be at university locations because really what we're doing is we're preparing people for that uh, independence of college. The, these, these are uh, college-bound campers that uh, you know we want them to be successful in college and deal with all that unstructured uh, uh, time, and uh, you know we want them to be successful. So do you, lastly, do you have any uh, pieces of advice for parents or even for um, people who are struggling with this kind of tech addiction themselves? I would say for parents, you know, uh, you need to give your kids the opportunity to learn how to turn devices off themselves. I think as parents, naturally, we go into this policing mode where we say, you know, okay, that's it, enough video games today, you know, turn it off. You've got to quit doing that. Y you have to instill in your kids the ability to say, okay, uh, yep, I want to, uh, I've got this goal. I want to try out for the soccer team. I want to, you know, I want to get all A's this semester, whatever it is, you know, that, that goal they have, uh, th they have to have that internal dialogue where they say, okay, I've, I've played enough of this. I, I need to now go, you know, study or practice soccer or what, you know, whatever it is uh, they want to work on. That's great advice. That is. That's daunting advice. And that's, it's good. <laughs> but it's really, really good. It kind of takes a yeah. load off me. Like, I feel like my, one of my most important jobs is making sure screen time is over after the hour or two hours. <laughs> now you just program, program it in on the app so you don't have to do it anymore. It's yeah. just a no, thing pops up on the screen and, and, that says, you you're done. To let them, you have to let them fail, too. Yeah, you know, uh, nice. of course. you know, let them stay up all night one night and uh, uh, sleep in and miss class. Hey, how did that turn out? And that's it's, it's out of failures that, that you know, the pe people grow. Yeah, that is great advice. Thank you so much for joining us, Michael. My, Thanks, Dr. Jeff. Michael Bishop is a retired psychologist, camp founder, Elvis impersonator, husband and father. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> there he is. He can be found at summerlandcamps.com and at Summerland Camps on Twitter. Thank you so nice. much for taking the time to talk to us. Yeah, thank, <laughs> thank you. you so much. We really appreciate it. Have a good night. All right, feedback time. Matt Borkin wrote in to TNT at twit.tv to say, in episode 1827, you talked about the idea of playing audiobooks to keep dogs entertained while you're away from home. I would just like to add that whenever my wife leaves the house and nobody will be home, she'll use our Google Home and say, okay, G, play relaxing spa music. The cats absolutely love that playlist. It keeps them chilled out for hours. Mm -hmm. And he's even attached a picture of, he says, the fuzzballs. He says it works. Meow. There they are listening to listening to their tunes. <laughs> their spa music. So, yeah, I listened to the Caesar um, Malone. What's his name? Caesar Malone. <laughs> Sorry. Dog Burke. Whisperer. I got it wrong on, la on the last show. Burke so, yeah. is <laughs> such a fan of Caesar Milan, and you don't have a dog currently. It's amazing. Uh, I listened to his uh, Why Dogs Like audiobooks, audiobook, and I haven't tried it with the dog. The problem is, like, if I'm not, it's like as a tree, when a tree falls in the forest, you hear it or not. Like, when I leave an audiobook on for my dog, is he calm or not? Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I guess if he, like, if your dog regularly chews stuff up or pees on the floor and he doesn't, then you would know, but. You just have to get an echo, echo look or an echo yes, show. Yes, I need the, the camera. To check yes. in on it. Uh, Burke says, I, I learned to train peeps or pups people. people. Oh, okay. oh, he, oh, he uses the Caesar Milan to train us to do what he wants. Oh, now it all makes <laughs> sense. <laughs> woof, woof. <laughs> After the break, a familiar app wants to once again, show you how you can use augmented reality to be racist. But first let's take a minute to thank Eero, the sponsor of this episode. With Eero, you can install an enterprise grade Wi-Fi system in your home in just a few minutes. Simply download the Eero app on your iOS or your Android device, and it'll walk you through each step of the process. It is quick, it's easy, and I promise you from the bottom of my heart, it is painless. You can easily create and share a guest network, know how many devices are connected at any given point, and check the internet speed that you're getting from your service provider. Eero is also protected with state-of-the-art WPA2 encryption. It updates automatically. You don't even have to think about it. You'll have the latest features and security at all times. And now Eero is excited to introduce the second generation Eero, and the Eero Beacon. Eero home Wi-Fi system started in early 2016. Since then, they've learned from hundreds of thousands of systems, 
making them smarter, faster, and more reliable. They know what devices you're using and how you're using them. It's way different than it was when you got that router that you have now. The new Eero second generation and Eero Beacon allow a customer to build a Wi-Fi system that's more perfectly tailored to their home than ever before. They offer more speed and range and the same high quality, elegant design that people have come to expect. This is something that you'll want to put right up there on the credenza next to your vases of flowers and uh, it looks really nice, just like, like, like the rest of your furniture. With the addition of a third 5 gigahertz radio, the second generation Eero is now tri-band and twice as fast as its predecessor, which lets customers do more simultaneously in every room of their house. With the addition of a new thread radio, Eero can connect to low power devices such as locks, doorbells, other sensors, and more. Expanding your coverage in any room is easy with Eero Beacon. All you have to do is plug it into the wall. Everybody knows how to do that, and then you're covered. You can add as many Eero beacons as you want. If there's an outlet, there's Wi-Fi. Set up the new Eero Wi-Fi system in my house. I set it up, and I can see the difference already. It's not just that my Wi-Fi is faster. I also have lots of control over the devices that are connected to my network. So as my kids go back to school and start having homework again, I can cut down on my HSN. That's hours spent nagging. And then turn off their connections <laughs> with the Eero app on my phone or with my Amazon Echo. Although maybe, as we learned from our last guest, I don't need to do that anymore. I can just check. I probably will still need to do it for a while. It's genius. For free overnight shipping, visit Eero.com and at checkout, select overnight shipping, then enter TNT. Then you make it free. That's Eero.com, enter code TNT. And we thank Eero for their support. TNT's fan of the day is Richard Lesh on Twitter, who sent us this picture saying, via Android Auto on my way to and from work. That's how he listens to TNT or watches. Don't worry, pick snapped at a stoplight. Uh, okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if you have kids in the car. Thanks for keeping me up to date. Thank you yeah. for yeah. showing us how you watch. We like, to, as I've said before on this show, uh, we watch, like to watch you watching us. Show us how you watch or listen to TNT, record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup, post it on Instagram, Google+, Twitter, or Facebook. Use the hashtag how I watch TNT and we will find it. So you probably remember Face App. That's the face changing app that got into hot water months ago when it's hot filter seemed to make people whiter. They removed that feature back then and it was assumed they learned something from that experience. And then this week, this week happened, FaceApp pushed an update that allowed people to take a picture of a face and apply ethnic filters to them uh, into Asian, Indian, and black faces. FaceApp CEO Yaroslav Goncharov said the ethnicity filters were designed to be equal in all aspects by being represented by the same icon and the order of them shuffled at random. Uh, but in the end, people are understandably sensitive to this sort of thing. The developer has since removed the ethnicity filters from the update. Have no fear, though. 2.0 does offer other things like giving you a hipster beard or makeup. <laughs> uh, the worst part of this is it costs money. It's a subscription service. Oh, Face it's so $2. They're, they're adding new filters all the time. <laughs> if you want to be racist, it'll cost you $2 a month. Um, maybe that's, I don't know. <laughs> it's $9.99 a year. Uh, or a $20 one-time fee. That's one way to make money um, for sure, yeah. Now, in the TechCrunch piece that, that we saw this, it says this app could have very cool use cases. Can you think of any? <laughs> <laughs> Changing faces? I mean, that's all it does. I don't know. Okay. I don't know. So, like, it's just, it just seems kind of tone deaf to today's climate, I political know. climate. It's, it's it just does. not the right time for this. I don't know if there ever, ever is a right time for this, but especially not right now. Right. Just like an <laughs> app that's out there like this. I, I don't know. I mean, I could, I could, I saw this in a comment and this is an honest question and you can tweet at me or email me at Megan at twit.tv if you, if for some reason this is completely wrong, but someone said, what, what about maybe using, uh, using this, uh, virtual reality or augmented reality or whatever it is, I guess it's augmented reality, could putting a different race on your face give you more empathy? Yeah, I mean, that's certainly one aspect that I had not considered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, th I think it's a, it's a very valid question, right? Is like, at what point does, at what point is this just an kind of a, a unique feature that's interesting to try versus crossing a line and making some sort of a, a statement that is going to offend a lot of people? Or is the idea of doing this at all just flat out offensive 
to to some people and i i i feel like the latter is is probably true as a result it's probably not really a good time to do this you know what i mean because you're always going to end up offending someone doing this maybe their maybe their intentions were not at all you know what they're being painted as but perception is reality in a lot of these cases and uh, i think a lot of people perceive something like this to be offensive and mm -hmm. as a result it like they're they're your paying customers so if you want to tick off your paying customers by doing something that could be perceived as being you know uh, offensive and potentially racist, then I guess you do this. And then you realize everybody tells you not to do it and you pull it out like they did. <laughs> right. I mean, I don't want our goal in life or the internet to be to avoid offending people. Like yeah, that's, right. uh, but I, I think in a controlled setting, maybe, you know, if you were going to teach kids about racism or empathy or something, you might have someone say like, Hey, let, you know, here's what your face looks like with this, a different ethnicity um, and then talk about it, you mm -hmm. know, but just in a free app like this. Also, there were some issues with what they, you know, I, I, I didn't see this, but I mean, there was some, someone I, I saw that someone said that like the, the African-American man filter had like dirty teeth or something like, which is horrible like that, you know, so if, if they're doing it without any um, guidance or sensitivity. Yeah. I mean, that's a good question because it's, um, because it's built around artificial intelligence, right? And and so essentially, from what I understand, it's doing it's scanning all of these images and making a map of the face that you give it, give it, and then finding matches and merging those those matches to that particular face structure, that particular angle, and everything like that. So at what at what point do you go down that road and then say these images are okay, but these are not because you know that gives them dirty teeth or whatever that whatever the, the quality is yeah. that would tip the scales. Right. You know I, I mean, mean, this is a big, this is funny um, that they haven't learned this, but this is a big question about AI, right? Like is, I mean, AI is not inherently racist. Not, not like a machine can't be inherently right. racist, but we can be insensitive as we're creating uh, products out of this and make them racist. Yeah. And there are a number of examples yes. <laughs> uh, to point in that direction. Tay is another prime example of that. Uh, TNT records live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 2300 UTC at twit.tv slash live. You can always be part of the show. You just have to email us. That's all you got to do. TNT at twit.tv. You can also leave us a voicemail. You never do. But if you want to, 260-TNT-SHOW. <laughs> and you can hit us up on Twitter. We are at Tech News Today TV. Find all the ways to subscribe to this and all of our shows at twit.tv. And if you want to tweet at me, I am at Megan Maroney. I'm sure I've said something uh, either uh, offensive or um, interesting. So tweet at me. I would side with interesting. Offensively interesting. Interestingly offensive? I don't know. Perhaps. Maybe something about a, a I, couch chicken or I don't know. I, w I want to offend. I, I wanted to offend someone in this show. I hope I did. <laughs> <laughs> Let her know. Uh, you can find me at, at Jason Howell. You can see, see me because I'm very curious to know as well. Uh, thanks to our technical director, Brian. Uh, thanks to Burke and also Colleen. Uh, for sitting next to Burke and helping to hold up Burke chat. It's really helpful. Uh, thanks to Kevin for editing the show and thanks to you for talking tech with us today. Uh, Megan, I'll see you tomorrow. I won't be here, but have fun. <laughs>